All right, it's July 4th weekend. You guys got big plans? Big plans, woohoo, we got some celebrations going on. Uh, what all, you know, in the chat or however you want, or the people you're with, what, what are you thinking about doing? You got some, got some big fish strategies going out there like a barbecue? Barbecue's a big July 4th celebration, yeah, nothing like that, you know, uh, fireworks. Got the Lee Greenwood all queued up on the, uh, on the old tape deck. Get some proud to be an American blaring for the, uh, you gotta have that. I, look, I, I'm not judging. That's, those, are, those are ways to celebrate Independence Day. I just feel like they've gotten a little stale. So I feel like uh, this, uh, this Independence Day, maybe we sauce it up a bit. You know, may, maybe get this a uh, little, do something, some new things. We need some new things. And, and so we're in this mindset as we're in this message series in Romans chapter 12 where, called Renew, where we're thinking about how to do some new things. So here, I have a few ideas to pitch uh, maybe for new ways to celebrate uh, July 4th. Uh, idea number one, you maybe just pick one of these, but idea number one, uh, throw a tea party. <laughs> throw a tea party. I mean, it, I, I don't, I'm not telling you how to throw your tea party. I mean, if you've got a swimming pool and a lot of tea you're never going to drink, that's an option. Uh, maybe if you're like me, you like to golf, uh, maybe take a handful of, of golf teas and throw them in your favorite water hazard. Uh, tea party, t-shirts, tea bones, I don't know, okay? You figure it out, but maybe throw a tea party. All right, that's one. Idea number two, um, this is a good one. Uh, you could dress up like Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, everyone? Not Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam's been done. We've had enough of that. That guy, I want you, you know, the finger pointing. We don't point fingers anymore. You could dress up like Uncle Sam. I mean, because nothing says, hey, I'm celebrating Independence Day, uh, like a top hat drawn on top of your ankle um, with some cotton balls glued on for a beard, which, by the way, I think an Ankle Sam tattoo would win the day for best tattoo ever. All right, Ankle Sam, that's, uh, that's an idea. Uh, you could play a new game. Maybe, uh, with, uh, maybe do it right now, wherever you are. Um, new game you could play, it's called 17 or 76. 17 or 76. It's a little math game. You just figure out which age you're closer to, 17 or 76. And then for the rest of the day, you have to either act like a teenager or a crotchety old person. <laughs> little math. I'm at that magic age. I'm crossing over. I'm 47, okay? This is a special year for me. This is a big, big deal, 47 years old. So I am 30 years away from 17 and only 29 years away from 76. That's right, I've crossed over. I'm, I, I'm over the bunker hill. A little American revolutionary joke for you. You're welcome. All right, last idea, and I think this is probably my favorite out of all of them. Uh, you could just declare your independence. That's a good idea. I, I mean, just declare it. Uh, regarding anything you want, it, just declare it. I mean, because that's basically what we're celebrating. A bunch of people went, ah, we're declaring our independence. It didn't mean anything. You just declared it. Like, you're addicted to Dunkin' Donuts? Just walk into a Dunkin' Donuts and declare your independence. I'm done with you. You'll probably be back on Monday. I get it. Just because you declare your independence doesn't mean there isn't going to be a war. But maybe there is uh, something in your life that it's, it's time to get some independence from. Uh, maybe social media has been like ruining and, and, and just ruling your life. And uh, it's time to declare your independence. Uh, probably the best place to do that would be on social media. And this is what we do, right? We go on social media and then we say, okay, I'm, I'm going to take a break from social media. I'm not going to be on here for a while. I mean, now you got to check back every 30 minutes to see who's upset by that and how many people liked it and <laughs> who's supporting me and got my back. Just because you declare depend independence doesn't mean that there's not going to be a war. Maybe there's an unhealthy relationship or an addiction or something in your life that really needs to change. Um, today could be a day where you just say, yes, I'm going to declare my independence. And like I said, it doesn't mean there's not going to be a war. There is a war still to be fought. But the war is worth fighting because God's got freedom. And freedom is good. In the book of Galatians, it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Let us not return again to a yoke of slavery. And so if God has given us real freedom, I mean, even greater freedom than we have as citizens of the United States, this freedom that we have in him, the best thing we can do is be free. To live in the freedom that he gives us, not be enslaved to anything or have any other thing controlling us anymore, but to be free in his grace, in his mercy, in his love. And that's what this message series from Romans 12 is all about. Renew. To be new. 
to have a new mind, a new view, a whole new worldview. And so our memory verse is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We want you all, wherever you are, do this out loud. I, I know it may be weird, you know, wherever you are, but go ahead and say these words from Romans chapter 12, verse 2, out loud. Let's read them together. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right, the pattern of this world is, is really wrapped up in control and, and slavery and, and identity being based on all these other things. But what God has for us is a new identity, a new identity in him where we are who he says we are. And when we begin to understand not only who God is, but who we are, and most importantly, who we are in relationship to God, Okay, now there is this renewing of our minds that is happening. And when there's a renewing of the mind, then it gives us a new view. And so if we think about a new world view, uh, a new world view means that we have a different lens that we're looking at the, the world through. Our, our old world views might have been something along the lines well, of, you, you know what, I got to look out for number one. I mean, I'm the most important. I'm the center of my universe. So everything revolves around me. Every decision is about how does this impact me and what I want to do. But a new world view would say, well, no, Jesus is Lord and I am his. And it's not about just the here and now, but it's about his eternal kingdom. And so he here I am, what do you want to do? An old world view would say when we pray, we go to God and we say, okay, God, um, I know you're big and I know you're powerful and I know you're strong and I know you have lots of ability, which is good because I got lots of things I need you to do for me. And that's an old world view. So an old world view can, can really show up in even the way we pray. I've got problems I need you to fix. I've got provision I need you to provide. You know, I've made, I've made mistakes that I, I want you to, to just kind of gloss over. I don't want to have to suffer the consequences of those. But what we have the opportunity to do is to, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to take a new worldview that is based on the lens of the lordship of Jesus. It's almost like if we could just put on lordship glasses, what a gift that would be, to then see the world like through the lens of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and that he is Lord and he has authority and I'm his and this is my primary chief identity. What a gift that would be. And so when we think about having a new view, uh, first and foremost, I really believe that we need to have a new view of self. A new view of self. This great question, who am I and what am I here for? The question of identity. And we're wrestling with this. Now, this idea of a, a new gift, a, a new view of self is really we have a, an opportunity to receive a gift from God, to receive the identity that he has for us. So we're going to open up Bibles uh, to Romans chapter 12 and pick it up in verse 3. And as we study Romans 12, we'll look at verses 3 and 4. But first, we'll read verse 3. It says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you, than you ought. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, this verse right here is, is a powerhouse verse. He begins by saying, okay, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you. This word grace, it's a gift. Okay, grace in and of itself is the gift of God. We don't earn grace. We don't deserve grace. Grace is something that God extends to us freely, no strings attached. It's not because somehow or the other, we were good little boys and girls and God was like, all right, I'll give you some grace. And while we were still sinners, God said, I will send my son Jesus to do for you what you could never do for yourself. This is the gift of grace. Grace is a gift, but so is life. And what happens is, is we forget that life is a gift and, and grace is a gift and, and that the fact that we can have a relationship with God and, and receive love and then not only receive love, but, but share love. All of this is a beautiful gift. When we lose sight of the gift and we start thinking that we deserve it, we've earned it, we're entitled to it, maybe we begin to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. The way he writes this is fantastic. I, I mean, it, contextualizing it in today's world, I, I think, is a, is a good idea. He says, uh, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather with sober judgment. You have a couple of words there, sober. You, got, you guys get what that means? And then highly. So I was like, am I high? 
I mean, like, if all of a sudden I think I'm the ultimate, I'm the pinnacle, everything's about me, am I thinking of myself more highly than I ought? Am I, am I out of my mind? Have I lost touch with reality? And, and in our own minds, we can even begin to say, well, no, that is reality. That's, that's the real stuff. That's what, what life is really about. But no, we're, we're high. We've lost touch. But with sober judgment, well, wait a minute. I, look, I know my limitations. I know my shortcomings. I know my failures. I, I have some idea of the damage I've done. The consequences of, of my actions or inactions, my words or the things I didn't say that I should have said. Think of yourself with sober judgment. And this is a gift that God gives us. He says, for it is by grace given to me, I say to every one of you. Let's all listen to this. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober, sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. And so when we think of, of who we are, we see ourselves through God's eyes, and God's eyes are eyes of grace. That's how he looks at us. Oftentimes we don't look at ourselves that way, or certainly others. Instead of looking at, at other people with eyes of grace, we may look at other people through eyes of judgment. We're cautioned about that over and over and over again in the scriptures because it's deadly for our souls. It destroys the life inside of us. It makes us miserable because we're not equipped to judge other people. We're thinking too highly of ourselves when, when we're pointing fingers at other people and, and trying to punish them, whether it be relationally or otherwise, for the things that they did or didn't do. And so we think of ourselves with sober judgment, but we see ourselves through the eyes of grace. Now, this means we don't think too highly of ourselves or too lowly of ourselves. Both matter, and we begin to understand who we are. There's a phrase I, I've been using a lot over the past uh, year. I'm thinking about it, writing about it a little bit. I'm not who I was. I'm becoming more like I am. Now, I'll unpack that for you. I'm not who I was. I Man, I know, I, I, I was lost. I was dead in sin. I was going my own way, doing my own thing, trying to be my own Lord, building my own kingdom that would surely crumble and fall and would never last. But I'm not who I was because of the grace of God, but I'm becoming more like I am, the I am, God himself being made not only in his image, but now being recreated in the image of the I am, the one who creates, who causes to exist, the one that we can't define or name, but he reveals himself. He says, I am. And then in that relationship with the father who says I am, he declares, you can know who you are in him but it's a new view. We look at ourselves differently. And so I want you to think about who you are. And even to say this, I am. Think about this right now. If somebody just said, who are you? How would you answer? You would begin with, I am. Now what? Maybe a name? Okay, well, tell me more. Maybe a, a job? A role, a service you perform? I am maybe where you live, maybe uh, your family and, and where you fit in there. In our minds, here's an opportunity to rethink this whole identity piece of I am. I am a child of God, adopted by the king, chosen, not because of anything I've done, but because of who he is. And because he loves me and he has a place for me and I am his servant and I am his uh, a co-heir. I am his child. I'm a co-laborer with Christ. I am. A new lens, a new view. And so when we think about I am right here in this verse, there's a, a few identity pieces I'd like to pull out. One is I am an object of grace. Grace, this gift. Grace is this gift. And, and grace uh, takes care of of our two big errors, thinking too highly of ourselves or too lowly of ourselves, I'm not good enough or I'm too good. There's two reasons why people reject God's grace, this amazing gift. One is they say, well, what I've done is beyond God's ability to forgive. 
like somehow or the other, your capacity to sin is greater than God's ability to forgive. I will tell you no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, God's grace is sufficient. He is greater. The second would be to go, grace? That's for all those suckers. That's for all the losers. That's for all the, you know, the scoundrels and the dirtbags and, you know, the actual sinner types. Axe murderers, right? I mean, I mean, I'm not one of those. Whoever, like, we compare ourselves to and say, well, I'm not that. Grace is just for that. But, you know, I'm over here. Okay, you've already, I, we're thinking too highly of ourselves. We're all, every human, in desperate need of grace. We all need grace exactly the same. I need grace, you need grace, but we are objects of grace. So who am I? I'm an object of grace. God's grace extended to me, extended to you, extended to every one of us. It's a gift. We are saved by grace through faith, and it's not from ourselves, but the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 through and 9. I'm an object of grace. I'm also... Not the greatest. That's hard for me to say. <laughs> I, I, I want to be the, the greatest. I like this idea of sober judgment. I, I'm not the greatest. I, I've learned, you know, throughout life that whenever you think you're the, the greatest at anything, there's someone to come along <laughs> who is better. But I, I grew up, there was a time in my life where there was this song uh, by this country artist named Mac Davis. I don't know how I got into this, but this guy named Mac Davis, and he had this song called, Oh Lord, It's Hard to Be Humble When You're Perfect in Every Way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a, a hell of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. I wore that tape out. <laughs> that was like my anthem. I have no idea. Like, why as a kid is, I mean, this, this resident, like, that's my jam. That's, that speaks to my soul. <laughs> I, I think ultimately probably what spoke to me was the irony and the humor in that and the cleverness of the lyrics. But isn't that a part of who we are sometimes? Sometimes it really is hard to be humble, particularly if we think too highly of ourselves, if we think we are perfect in every way. I, I will tell you, if you look at every problem that you have, and you all have problems, I know, every family problem, you know, it's your sister's fault. It's your mom's fault. It's your spouse's fault. Every problem you have in your, your workplace, it's your boss's fault. It's your coworker's fault. Every problem going on in your neighborhood, it's your neighbor's fault. Every problem you've ever experienced in church, well, it's the church's fault. You are the common denominator in all of these problems. And we do that, but I'm not the greatest. And if we can just get to that place to go, okay, well, wait a minute, who is? Well, he is. God is. I'm, I'm going to turn to him, and I'm going to look to him. So I'm not the greatest. And, and one more um, I am defined by faith. I am defined by faith. By faith. Instead, uh, look at yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So this faith, even faith is a gift of God, because sometimes we can be like, yeah, I have, I have a lot of faith. Like, I, I went out and I really earned my faith, and I worked really hard at my faith, and look at me. I have the greatest faith that there's ever been. Oh, we're missing it again. Or, I, you know what, I just, I'm not very good at faith. I could never have faith. Faith is a gift of God. We can ask him, God, can I have faith? Show yourself to me, and, and you are faithful, so help me to, to be faithful like you are faithful. I'm not who I was. I'm becoming more like I am, like God. Now, that, that I am that I'm referring to, it comes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. 
It's where Moses encounters the burning bush in the, the wilderness. So this is the Old Testament. Uh, the Israelite people have been enslaved in Egypt for like 400 years. Moses has is, is been raised in Pharaoh's household, the, the most powerful ruler in the world probably at that time. And um, he, he's a, an Israelite, but he was raised in Pharaoh's household. And he has now run away and, and he's out in the middle of nowhere like tending sheep. And he sees a burning bush. A bush that's on fire but is not being consumed by the fire and i love moses he's a dude he does what dudes do dudes see something on fire we go right, check that out never been a dude that ever saw fire that wasn't like i'm gonna check that out moses heads over and check it out he's like that's a fire bush is burning bush isn't burning up whoa what's going on then the bush talks Moses is like, I need some sober judgment right now. I don't know what that bush is, but I may have inhaled it. Because <laughs> the bush is talking. And the, the bush knows his name. The bush is getting really personal. The bush is now asking him to do crazy things. Like, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. And I want you to go to Pharaoh. And I want you to say, hey, Pharaoh, let your slave labor force go. And Moses is like, I don't think so. I mean, Moses knows better than anybody. He grew up in Pharaoh's household. He knows the economic value of the slave labor force. He's like, I, I'm, not, I'm not going back. I mean, I'm wanted for murder in Egypt. I'm not going back there, first of all. Second of all, if I do go back, I know Pharaoh. He's not going to listen to me. He, you know, they, they don't want me there. Um, I don't want to go there. It's risky. And you want me to tell them what? And so Moses is like having this conversation with the bush. And finally he says, okay, who am I to say has sent me to you? And the bush says, this is what you're to say to the Israelites. Exodus 3, 14. Say to them, I am has sent me to you. I am. The one who creates, who causes to exist. This is, is who he is. So Moses at this point now, he's got to pivot because now it's like, okay, wait a minute. What, what are we dealing with here? And so his next argument is to say, well, I'm not, I'm not good enough. You want me to go talk to Pharaoh? I don't speak well. And that's something that we do. I mean, it's like Moses eventually does go, but it's, it's a faith that happens. He knows, in his mind, it's a fool's errand. He knows he's not really equipped for it. He knows he's probably the last guy who should be doing this. It, he knows that he doesn't, isn't that eloquent of speech. He knows that he's not really a good leader. But by faith, he goes. And God does his thing. And so whatever you were or whoever you are, you don't have to be who you were, but you can become more like I am. But that's a faith thing. We're defined by faith. By faith in who God is, what God has done, and what God has promised to do. And this is a powerful thing. Once we become defined by faith, now, now in him, we discover what life is really all about. And so we need a new view of self. Now when we have a new view of self, then we can have a new view of church. And we need a new view of church. Uh, one of my favorite things um, about COVID, which is a weird statement to make because everybody's like, there's nothing good, all kinds of good. God works in cool ways, but a lot of our, our damaging views of church, we had the opportunity to redefine them during some times of isolation and social distancing. One of them being that, okay, church is a building that you go to where you have your like spiritual time. A church is not a building, church is a people. And so if we have a new view of self and we are the church, then we end up having a new view of church as a whole. And so we continue reading there in Romans, uh, pick it up in verse four of Romans 12. It says, for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Well, this is a, a new view of church. Instead of uh, thinking about uh, who we are in relationship to God on an individual level, we start thinking about this in community. It's not just me, it's we. Church is not a, a place where I go to have my needs met, uh, but rather it is a people who are experiencing this new identity and God's love is moving through us. So even as we pray for one, 
It's a real simple prayer. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Will you pray that with us? Let's all pray together. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, we can start to immediately think, okay, how am I gonna do that? And, and what are the steps I'm gonna take? And, but immediately we might individualize this and think it's some kind of solo operation. It's never been meant for that. We share God's love in community. And so you are a part of sharing God's love with my ones, the people I'm praying for every day. And, and I get to be a part of sharing God's love with your ones, the people you're praying for every day. And together as the church, the local church of people, we do this, but we need a new view of church. And so it's pretty cool there. It says the, it, it's going to go into this, this body metaphor. The, the body is made up of many parts, all kinds of different parts with different functions. Uh, so is the church. So there's all kinds of different people. So when we think about the church and, and we get this new view, we would see that the church is diverse. It, it better be at least Diverse. Now, depending on, on where you live and where the local church you're experiencing uh, may be present, um, diversity may, be, may look different. So diversity can be diverse. There's a novel concept. A lot of times when we think of diversity, our, our minds might immediately go to racial diversity. Well, yeah. You know what? Churches need to be more racially diverse. This should be the most obvious thing ever. The most segregated places in and organizations in our country today are churches? How, how is, I mean, I know how this has happened, but we haven't valued diversity. We haven't looked for it. Um, this has happened more and more as we've been um, targeted uh, via social media and media as a whole, and our, our beliefs are constantly reinforced. And then you had the isolation uh, that occurred during COVID to where maybe you didn't have to interact with somebody or anybody that ever disagreed with you. You kind of got, maybe some people I think got used to it. And, and whatever like bench you may have had, let's, let's say, let's do, it, let's do it politically. You know, you have conservative people and liberal people. Those are the only two kinds of people in the world. There's, there's no moderates. If you are, then you're completely ridiculed and blasted and called a traitor and everybody hates you. How I love to be hated. You're, you're conservative or, or liberal. And if you're conservative, well, uh, you, you, don't, you don't listen to anything that might have a liberal mindset because it's wrong and it's evil and it's horrible and blah, blah, and labels. And, and if you're, you're liberal, you don't listen to anything conservative because it's unloving and it's, it's mean-spirited and it's awful and nah, nah, nah. And then you isolate and you only, you turn into your news channel of choice, blare it like you do, particularly if you're closer to 76 than 17, and <laughs> let it run continuously and fill your mind with all kinds of garbage while never having a single human being you value and trust and love be able to say anything different, that's a recipe for disaster. Oh, okay, now uh, hey, let's get back together for a 4th of July picnic. We're going to have a different kind of fireworks this year. <laughs> We need to be diverse. I, I've heard more than ever people saying things like, I need to find a more conservative church. I don't think you do. I think if that's your bent, you need to find a more liberal church maybe. Be stretched a little bit. Have the opportunity to think, well, I need to find a more liberal church. I don't think you do. I think maybe you need to, to find some people who think a little bit differently and still love Jesus. And embrace them and walk with them and learn from them because you're a little rough around the edges. The church ought to be diverse. It needs to be diverse. The church ought to, uh, uh, is connected. One body, many parts. So e even in the, the, the global church, capital C, the body of Christ, the family of God, you know, all, all followers of Jesus who have the Holy Spirit through all time, yes. But then what these local churches, these local expressions, we're all still connected, the different parts of the body, and we need each other. We need each other. It's kind of a mystery how all this works. I mean, it's like, I mean, like we get how the body works. I mean, like you have a, a nose, and the, the nose has the sense of smell. You have feet, you know, start at the top of the top of your head, your nose, and you have feet at the bottom. You know, feet, uh, you can walk or, or run. 
different parts of the body, different functions. I mean, it's not like you could have smelly feet or a runny nose. That wouldn't work. Oh, sorry. You smelling what I'm stepping in? <laughs> but it is, they're, in, they're connected to one another. And because they're connected, they're also dependent. And so they're, they're sharing in this together. We're connected. We need each other. But then we're also dependent upon one another. And this is a beautiful thing in the church. And so we're not meant to do this on our own. We need a new view of church. Now, with this new view of church also comes a new view of oneness. And I love this word, oneness. I like the word oneness uh, a little bit better than the word unity, a word that's oftentimes used. A lot of times we think about uh, unity, meaning that we agree on everything. You know, we, we, we think about the United States of America. I, I'm so tired of hearing people, we're more divided than ever. No, we're not. We had a civil war. I'm not sure if you guys have studied history. We are not more divided than ever. I mean, the, the stuff that was, has gone on and the social change, it's just, it's not true. Don't buy the lie. Probably, in generally speaking, we agree on the vast, vast majority of things. If we would stop saying we've got to be united on every single thing and instead embrace oneness. Oneness meaning that we are diverse and we celebrate that and we are connected and we celebrate that and we are dependent and we celebrate that. I don't really think that's going to happen with our country, but I know for a fact it can happen with our church. How about you? Woohoo? Woo I believe that. That's the hope that God has for us. And so we need this new view of oneness. Jesus even prayed for it. John chapter 17. Jesus is, is praying for this. And if Jesus is going to pray for it, I, I think uh, we ought to pray for it too. Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be, what? One. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This oneness thing is, is huge. Jesus prayed for it for his followers, that we would be one. Now, oneness is really cool. Oneness is really special. Uh, when we experience this oneness, let me give you, a, I want you to be free. Right? We're celebrating freedom. So here, here's a little freedom. Oneness, you don't, have to, you don't have to like everyone. You gotta love them. You don't have to like them. Some people just rub us the wrong way. Some people are abrasive. Everybody knows someone that you're just like, I'm not sure I could ever like that person. And if you don't know that person, you're probably that person for everybody else. Because it's just how it is. You don't have to like everyone, but we, we do love everyone. We do respect everyone. We are kind to everyone and compassionate to everyone. Doesn't mean you have to like everyone. Uh, you also don't have to agree with everyone. This is a crazy one. So I know sometimes people are like, well, you know, I was going to this church and the pastor said something I didn't agree with, so I can't go there. I'm like, <gasps> Like, that's, that's probably not a good thing. Like, um, I probably, okay, my wife loves me. I assure you she does not agree with everything I say. <laughs> She's made that crystal clear multiple times. But it's not like, well, I don't agree with him anymore. We can't be married. I'm not sure I agree with everything I say. In fact, I know I, know I don't. I can be wrong. Also, if, if nobody in the church you're, you're worshiping with and, and joining together ever says anything that, that makes you go, huh, I don't know about that, or I really should probably look into that, or I'm not sure about that, then how are you sharpening one another? How are you encouraging one another? How are you challenging one another? Wherever you are, I hope that you're, you're able to experience this message in community or find somebody to talk about this with and let the sparks fly a little bit in love and respect and and enjoy the conversation. And I've, I've never thought about it that way. Would you consider looking at it from this angle? Well, I will. Okay, now we're on to something. We can be stretched and we can grow. 
You don't have to like everyone. You don't have to agree with everyone. And you don't have to enjoy everything. I'm telling you, I think this is sobering. Because when we think, like, whatever we're doing is all about us and our personal preferences, that is a recipe for misery. A miserable life. But if there can be things that aren't necessarily your cup of tea, that aren't necessarily what you would do or what you would enjoy, but others do, and you can appreciate that and learn to celebrate that other people are enjoying that, you will have so much more freedom and joy in your life. So much. And the church, oh, the church ought to be the most alive people on the planet. The most joyful not because our lives are hunky-dory and peachy keen and there's no problems. I would assume we're going to have more problems than anybody. But because we have one another and we have Jesus and his promises and a new view of who we are and who we get to be together and we embrace this oneness and pray for it. And so here's what I, I want to invite everyone to do. As Jesus prayed for one, let's pray for one too. Maybe um, today you're thinking, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure that I am one with Jesus and his church. I'm not sure. Well, you, you can be sure. If you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life and, and you say, Jesus, will you be Lord of my life? Then you're a part of his church and and you can say yes to his grace. I, yes, God, I, I need your grace and I, and I accept your grace, what you have done for me. I couldn't do it myself, but I receive this. If you say yes to him, now you can be sure that you have a place and a part and a role and you are a part of his church. And we're glad because we want you and we need you. And we're better with you and the diversity that we bring. And maybe uh, today, though, you, you're like, yes, I am part of the church, and I know that, and you can celebrate that, but you're saying, I know somebody who isn't yet, and I want to pray for that person. Right now is a perfect opportunity to be praying for somebody who maybe doesn't know who they are. And so right now, right wherever, wherever you are, I just want you to, to pray. Be assured that you are in his church and then pray for one who is not. Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now, anyone who says, I wanna know that I'm, I'm a part of your church, Lord, hear their prayer right now and assure them, show them. And Lord, for all these ones that we wanna share your love with, let us do that together. And we ask for that in Jesus' name.